ready. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends. In this episode, Battleship Iowa, a trump card that was never played. In the 1930s, the whole world was crazy about two things, swing music and guns. The passion that politicians and industrial moguls showed to the latter had all the signs of gigantomania. By finding legal loopholes in international arms control treaties and conventions, or simply ignoring them, countries were constantly building new and unprecedented weapon systems for both land and sea. They were becoming bigger, heavier, and more powerful. The global arms race involved the most advanced technologies of the time and huge financial resources. In order to compete with any of our potential enemies, it was felt necessary to increase the size of our ships. So the Iowa was a 45,000 ton battleship. The prior ships had been less, the South Dakota class and the North Carolina class. A battleship is basically a floating artillery battery, so her size directly depends on the size of her primary guns. The 16-inch main batteries on Battleship Iowa, of which there are three, three turrets. Each turret has three guns. So everything about the ship design is, uh, is, is structured around becoming, being a platform for the 16-inch guns. It's like small arms. There is a common misbelief that the pistol is designed first and then the cartridge. No, the defense ministry always orders the cartridge. The same for ships. The enemy has 15 inches and 12 inches. Let's make 16 inches because we already have some of the technologies. But let's not make it 40, but 50 calibers long. And they made a 16-inch gun. So the ship was built to carry this particular gun. Key specifications of battleship Iowa. Total displacement, 57,540 tons. Length, 887 feet, 6 inches. Beam, 108 feet, 3 inches. Draft, 36 feet, 1 inch. Armament. Primary armament, 9 Mark 7 guns in 3 triple turrets. Caliber, 16 inches. Maximum range, 24 miles. Dual-purpose artillery, 20 Mark 12 guns in 10 coaxial Mark 28 turrets. Caliber, 5 inches. Anti-aircraft armament, 19 quadruple Bofors guns. 52 Oerlikon Mark 234 autocannons. Air group, 3 Vought OS-2U Kingfisher float planes. During construction, Iowa's armor was declared higher than it actually was in order to mislead the enemy. The real specifications are as follows. Main belt, 12.1 inches. Main turrets, 7.2 to 17 inches. Conning tower, 7.2 to 17.3 inches. Main armor deck, 6 to 7 inches. Iowa has the most powerful power plant among battleships. Four geared turbine engines with eight turbines produced by General Electric. Eight boilers produced by Babcock and Wilcox. Power, 212,000 horsepower. Maximum speed, about 33 knots. Cruising range, about 20,000 nautical miles at a speed of 15 knots. Battleship Iowa had a very unique hull design in the bullnose. And, and you can also see that her lines were very tapered, almost aerodynamic. 
And uh, that's all part and parcel of how they got this 57,000 ton behemoth up to a speed of 33 knots, uh, which is very, very fast and almost, uh, you, could, you could say it's almost powerboat speed, you know, uh, very, very unusual uh, for a warship. This became an important advantage later on during the war in the Pacific Theater. With a speed like that, Iowa could efficiently escort carrier task forces. They put about 140 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns on the ship, and the carriers loved them because they were able to protect the carrier. When Iowa was still under construction, the Americans realized that she would play a secondary role in battles against the Japanese fleet. Aircraft carriers were becoming the main striking force of the Navy, but a giant like Iowa played a worthy role in the World War II. Battleship Iowa was commissioned in early 1943. Its first mission was to go north. Naval intelligence felt the Tirpitz, the German battleship, may be coming into the North Atlantic. The battleship Iowa was sent on an early mission north to block the Tirpitz. Suppose battleships Iowa and Tirpitz met in battle. Iowa had a higher speed, greater maneuverability, and longer range of fire. Tirpitz would be trying to get in close to Iowa, and Iowa would be looking to keep away, maneuvering and firing at Tirpitz from a great distance. Iowa would have definitely won this battle. But the two naval heavyweight warriors never met. So we can only imagine how their duel would have ended. Then, on their second mission in October 12th of 1943, was to uh, accompany, or I should say, carry Franklin Roosevelt across the Atlantic to North Africa. Uh, from there, he went on to visit with Churchill and Stalin in the Tehran Conference. Roosevelt was on board the ship for 15 days. When President Roosevelt came on board, the first thing he saw was Vicky. Now the first captain, Captain John McRae, brought little dog home one day, and his wife looked at the dog and said, get that thing out of here. So the Captain McRae took the dog and brought him on the ship. And President Roosevelt asked, who is this little dog? And Captain McRae said, well, that's our little ship's mascot named Vicky. So Vicky spent the whole 15 days of the Roosevelt Passage in the cabin with Roosevelt. He would roll a play tricks. Well, he wasn't very good as a sailor. He was very good as a dog. And Roosevelt really enjoyed Vicky. In early 1944, battleship Iowa joined the United States Fifth Fleet, which operated in the Pacific Ocean. By that time, U.S. forces were already attacking Japanese positions on various islands. The battleship's role was to provide fire support to landing troops and escort aircraft carriers during air raids on the Philippines, the Ruku Islands and Taiwan. The ship crisscrossing across uh, a lot of these small islands that are really forgotten now. At one point, they went up to support MacArthur's landing 
in the Philippines at Leyte Gulf. Unfortunately, they went the wrong way at Leyte Gulf and chased a Japanese carrier force that was really a decoy for the landing. They came back, but a little too late to assist in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. They missed that one opportunity to maybe have had a contact with the Yamato. The two ships never met in combat, and both countries kept their capital battleships, shall we say arm's length, kept them at distance, because there was great political risk to having either one of the ships damaged severely in battle. Japanese industry in those days simply didn't have the resources to build ships in large numbers. The solution was simple, to make huge ships that would exceed the largest ships of other nations. Super battleships. Battleship Yamato is the biggest battleship in the world. Her shell velocity was 2,600 feet per second, while its weight could be up to 3,300 pounds. Such a large gun could inflict very serious damage. They made us, the Japanese essentially broke the treaty. On the other side, the United States of America was simply building a ship that met the contemporary requirements of naval warfare and could easily, without any extra effort, be built by the American industry. During the war, the Japanese fleet could afford to build only two battleships, while the Americans were able to construct more and more new battleships. The Americans were simply building another ship, and she turned out to be a good one. The Iowa, I think, would have, of course I would probably say this, would have taken the day in a battle against the Yamato. She had very accurate fire control for a ship of the 1940s. And I think that would be an advantage for her if, if they should fight such a battle. It was so accurate that in 1984, when they recommissioned the ship, they kept the existing system in place. They did, even though they had modern computers, the Iowa could put around very, very close to the target, so accurate that they didn't need to change it. Iowa was the most dangerous enemy for a Yamato. If they had met at a range from 66,000 to 98,000 feet, especially in a one-on-one -on -one fight and in fine weather, Iowa would have no chance of winning. However, thanks to better radar, Iowa could fight in bad weather and at night. Powerful guns, high speed, and precise radar made Iowa a formidable adversary. If these two battleships had fought each other, the victory would depend completely on the battle conditions. We could get in quick and fire, but then there's always the lucky shot. Changing tactics of naval warfare increased the role of aircraft carriers and deprived Iowa of a chance to use its primary armament against surface ships. So the battleship used its firepower against the enemy's coastal positions. 
On August the 29th, 1945, when the war was virtually over, Iowa stood side by side with her sister ship, Missouri, and entered the Tokyo Bay as part of the occupation force. We were next to our sister ship, the Missouri, and the Missouri, of course, is where Douglas MacArthur accepted the final surrender of the Japanese. Now, we like to say on the Iowa that had Roosevelt lived, that signing might have been on the Iowa because he had been on the ship. But President Truman was from the state of Missouri, and, and so the, the signing was on the Missouri. Some of our a sailor that was on that trip once told me that I asked him if he was sad that he didn't get the signing instead of the Missouri. And he said, no, not really. He said the war was over. We had lived. We were going home to our wives and children. And all the guys on the Missouri were busy preparing a photo opportunity for Douglas MacArthur. The end of the war, we brought back a large number of American POWs, prisoner, Japanese prisoners of war, and we brought them home and sailed uh, through uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and the war was over. For her service in World War II, the battleship was decorated with nine battle stars. In 1949, Iowa was decommissioned into the reserve fleet, but two years later, she was recommissioned and sent on a mission to the coast of Korea. The battleship returned home with two more battle stars. From 1958 to 1984, Iowa was kept in reserve, and after modernization, she returned to active service again. However, the event that took place in the late 1980s showed that battleships can also sustain losses outside of wartime. On April 19th, 1989, the biggest tragedy that ever struck this ship occurred. The ship was about 400 miles or so north of Puerto Rico. As I understand it, they had loaded the shell in the number two turret, rammed in the powder, and they were about to close the breach when, some, when something happened. There was an explosion that killed 47 men. It was by far the biggest loss of life on the ship. Having recovered from the tragedy, the battleship returned home and joined the reserve fleet. In 2001, 58 years since her launch by the New York Naval Shipyard, after she had crossed tens of thousands of miles and fired thousands of shells at the enemies, battleship Iowa was berthed in the port of Los Angeles. She's unique because she did have three careers in the Navy, World War II, Korea, and the 1980s. And then now she's on her fourth career as a, as a museum ship. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called 